Coming up, we look at the latest advancements for Linux containers that allow you to connect your on-premises resources with the cloud for agility while maintaining data sovereignty and security. We'll look at the ability to run AKS connected to custom or private virtual networks, including on-premises and in the cloud, native integration to Azure Active Directory and Kubernetes RBAC for secure access to AKS, managed service identity at a per-container level to grant secure access to specific Azure resources, and securing your images with Content Trust in Azure Container Registry and deploying them with Helm charts. So I'm joined today by one of the founding fathers of Kubernetes, Brendan Burns, now one of the engineering leaders in the Azure Compute team. Welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's great to be back. So it looks like there are now lots of great updates to make it easier to use Kubernetes in the enterprise. And this builds on many of the existing advantages of using Kubernetes with containers today, from the great identity that comes through OS virtualization, to how, from an IT ops perspective, orchestration can help you to service containers and the apps running on them without incurring downtime, and at the same time, enabling super fast scale. And, and we demonstrated a lot of that last time you were on Microsoft Mechanics. Yeah, I think one of the great things about Kubernetes is it really can provide teams with agility, so the ability to deploy containers quickly, um, to roll out new versions while still maintaining a service with zero downtime. Uh, it's self-healing, so if you happen to have a bug and your application crashes, your application will get started back up by Kubernetes. It's got this application-oriented focus that really enables you to forget about the machine and focus on your app. And what we found is that while it was really great for uh, people building new web services and, and maybe startups and that sort of thing, it had some features that were, were missing, perhaps, for, for an enterprise environment. And you know, we've done a lot of work over the last six months to really add a bunch of those features to make it possible to gain the same advantages um, in an enterprise environment with the Azure Kubernetes service. Okay, great. So how are we updating the experience for enterprises with AKS? Well, so the, the primary thing we've been looking at is how do we improve security and manageability, con the management controls, where you may have different groups of people managing different kinds of resources uh, in Azure. OK, so where did we start with the security controls? So you know, the, the most important piece that we started with was the, uh, was the network. You know, one of the things we found from people, from talking to people, is that Kubernetes has to really customize the network that it's deploying into. Um, and so initially, we just created a virtual network for you. Right. But that doesn't work in a lot of enterprise environments where you have specialized circuitry like an express route or a VPN, or maybe you have a networking team that manages firewall rules and, and even create the creation of networking. So one of the features that we added was the ability to deploy a Kubernetes cluster into any virtual network, a virtual network that's been provisioned for you. So for for example, I'm over here on the, uh, the uh, Kubernetes cluster create screen in the Azure portal. Right. And if I go into the networking tab, well, in the basic configuration, there's not really anything for me to do. Yep. But if I click over here on advanced, what lights up is a, a bunch of different options. So I can choose a virtual network that I want to deploy into. I can customize the network, the subnets and IP ranges that the containers and the load balancers and everything in the network uses. This enables you to really customize the cluster to match the needs of your existing virtual network. Um, and I'm showing this to you here in the, you know, in the portal. But of course, you can do the same thing in PowerShell or the CLI if you want to integrate creating a cluster into CI CD or any other sort of automation. Awesome. So you mentioned access management. What's been added there? So yeah, so if we go over, if we go back up and we uh, look in the authentication section, we can actually turn on Kubernetes RBAC. So that's going to give you fine-grained access control to all of the resources inside of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, but even better than that, uh, what, we, what we enabled was the ability to do uh, use your Active Directory credentials for authenticating into your cluster. So we'll come over here. I'll show you a demo of that. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to connect using the native Kubernetes tools to that AKS cluster that I have. Um, and what you're going to see here is it's the standard device login prompt. So anybody who's used the AZ tool, PowerShell, anything, this is the way that you log in to Active Directory and get your credentials. Right. Um, so if we go over here and we uh, get that code, I'm actually going to create a uh, private window because, of course, I'm logged in here. So it wouldn't, yep. it wouldn't be nearly as exciting uh, <laughs> if, I, uh, if I use that. But let's say. Got to keep it real. So you're just going to log into the portal as you would normally. No it's actually not there. even the portal. It's, it's actually Active Directory itself, yep. right? So it's um, a separate login, actually, from it's your same login credentials, but the application right. ID that's being used is actually devoted to Kubernetes. And of course, it right. throws you through this prompt to make sure that you know that you're granting permissions to this application. Perfect. Um, and so we'll continue. Uh, and then it's going to ask me to sign in, obviously. 
and with this, anything native to Azure AD works? Like yeah, I mean, this like is the MFA. standard Active Directory. And in fact, at this point, it's going to prompt me uh, to go and uh, you know, put my password in here. So the key thing for enterprises here, they don't have to change the way their users are logging in and authenticating exactly. and so on. It just fits in. All of that stuff is going to fit in. And right. here, obviously, Microsoft has two-factor authentication set up. So I'm going to actually send a request to my uh, you're going to go with the mobile device option? I'm going to go with my mobile device here. And now we, I've got my handy mobile device here. Did that actually take? Oh, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to we'll wait here yep. for a second while the authentication comes through. And just as easily, you could give access to people. You can revoke access as well, just the yep. traditional. So the, uh, the prompts come through on my phone here right, for okay. access. I'm going to see that. approve my that. fingerprint. Yeah. Everybody saw that. All right, we'll go back over to, so now it's going to say, OK, you've successfully signed in. We can close that down. And if we go back over to the terminal, now I've gotten access and I've seen my nodes. But of course, that took us probably 45, 50 seconds yeah. to, to go through. That'd be pretty annoying if you had to do that every single time. So now that I've authorized the, the control line, logged in with my credentials, if I do any subsequent commands, um, you know, it just happens immediately, right? So it's a one-time setup um, to, to authorize on every new machine. But that gives you the confidence that you know, if somebody gains access to your credentials, if they try and log in from a different machine where you haven't gone through that flow yeah. and they don't have your phone, well, they're not getting in, right? Yeah. So it's really, a, a, it allows the enterprise security that you expect uh, to access the Kubernetes cluster. That's the key so. thing there is the enterprise levels of security. Exactly, and the policies like. that they have set. Yeah, right? and, and that's great news for Azure AD admins who are looking for that consistency with permissions and authorization. And you can automate access provisioning for convenience as well. So it's a great solution if you've got different types of admins where you need to define different permission levels. And right. how does this extend the access and use of specific resources from something like a DevOps perspective? Well, so of course, when you're developing cloud native applications, they need to access the cloud from the application themselves, right? So it's no longer the fact that just a user is creating a virtual machine and then that virtual machine runs some code. The code on those machines oftentimes is going to be accessing Azure itself for a data store like Cosmos or to find out about you know, its IP address or any other kind of information. Obviously, I don't want to use my identity there because I might be on a team with a bunch of developers. And so it doesn't make any sense for my identity to be bound in with the front end application. Right. But also, probably more importantly, I have a lot of capabilities. I can create virtual machines. I can do a bunch of different things. You probably don't want your application to have that. You want to scope it down to the least set of privileges that they yep. want. So you want to be able to give a, a, a container that's running in the Kubernetes uh, cluster specific permissions that are devoted to its role in the application, yeah. a front-end identity or a back-end identity. Yeah, just enough um, to do what it needs to do. Just enough to do what it needs to do. So we'll give you a little demo here of a pod that's going to ha have access to list uh, virtual machines. So what we're going to see here is we're going to deploy a container, a pod, that is going to try and use um, to access to list the virtual machines that I have in my subscription. So I've deployed that container. We'll make sure that it's up and running. So there you go. You can see it's running. It's been running for eight seconds. 10 seconds. That's so the top one in the list the there. top one there, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So we'll go out of there. Now what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to go into sort of a split screen mode here where I'm going to list the VMs. And what you see here is that I'm getting permission denied. Right? And I'm not getting permission denied because of the demo gods, but I'm getting permission denied because I actually haven't created the identity and associated it with this container. So let's right. go ahead and do that. So the so container at this stage doesn't have privilege. It doesn't have permissions. The code is running, but it right. doesn't have the token that gives it the permissions, right? Gotcha. So I've created a, an Active Directory identity for this container. Um, and now I have the identity and I have the container, but I haven't associated them together. Yep. So I'm going to create a binding that's going to associate that identity uh, with the container. And so what you're going to see in just a second uh, is that the uh, permission denied should turn into OK. Okay, so what's happening in the background here? So in the what background, what's happening is the token and the identity are actually being provisioned. Mm -hmm. um, they're being associated with the uh, they're being associated with the the container that's running. Um, and uh, with luck, if the demo <laughs> gods are in fact with me, you'll uh, so you'll see the the container start to be able to list the VMs. And is this something that you'll have to do every time, or is this something? Uh, this, is, this is something every time the you, you associate a new identity with a container. OK. All right. 
So this can take a few seconds to run. It can take in. some time to go through, but, uh, but... Is there anything else in terms of Azure Active Directory that admins out there need to set up in order to have this functionality uh, available? No, so it's, it's taking advantage of the MSI managed service identities right. that are available in... Oh, there we go. Uh, it's taking advantage of the managed service identities that are... Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's taking advantage of the managed service identities that are present on the VM. Right. But of course, that managed service identity is scoped to a specific VM. Yeah. We want it, there might be multiple containers on that VM, so what we do is we take that managed service identity and we um, uh, create these explicit service identities that are associated with each container and we sort of provide them to you at the same metadata endpoint that your code expects. Right. So the same code that ran in a VM will run in a container unchanged. Okay. That's pretty cool. Right. So the container gets its, its unique ID, different yeah. from the developer or the shared account. Right. You can dynamically grant these permissions or revoke and, and Yeah, exactly. And so you know, one thing that obviously we don't necessarily like to talk about our code getting compromised, but yep. it does happen. Um, and so you want to be able to revoke those credentials. And so what I'm doing here is I'm actually editing the definition of the container. Um, and I'm, this is the pod binding that it's associated with called demo. I'm just going to change this to be demo fail, uh, and we'll update that container. And what you'll see in just a second is that the permission is going to get revoked, um, and we're going to go back to getting permission denied uh, from the, the list of the VMs. Right. So you've essentially bound it to something that doesn't exist. Uh, I've bound, yeah, correct. That identity doesn't exist, and so right. I've bound it to something that doesn't exist, and so it should once the sort of eventual consistency, yeah, there we go, permission denied, because it's actually gone in, it's had the container where it had provided a token, and it's actually ripped that token away. Right. So you can, you know, effectively, if you know that, uh, that something's been compromised or you don't want to, you mistakenly granted permissions to something, you can really easily rip those permissions away with the running container still operating right. correctly, right? Okay. So uh, I wanted to show also that we can add the, these permissions back in. Okay. Um, so we can actually do the same thing and go in and uh, there we go. And now if I just go back in and I You're change the label back, the I'm going to reestablish yep. the binding. OK, sounds good. Uh, and then it's going to go ahead and uh, the permission will come back and we'll get OK going again. So that's a, a part of, of what it takes to secure an application. But you know, one of the other parts of the application security is it's only as secure as the code itself. Right. right. So it's great that I can give these permissions and I can revoke them. But if I have code that I don't trust, if someone can land you know, a, a binary that I don't know about, even a rogue developer, for example, someone who hasn't gone through my CI CD system, if they can land code into my container, well, all this security with AAD and all that, it doesn't really account to much. Right. right? So the good news is that with content trust and image content trust that is now part of the Azure Container Registry, we can actually go ahead and do those sorts of controls. So I'll give a little demo of that right now. So we're going to start out, um, we're going to log into the registry. Uh, and this is uh, a, just a standard Azure Container Registry, right. getting the credentials for that. Uh, now that I'm logged in, it's, it's configured this in, in Docker. Um, and we're going to go ahead and build an unsigned image. And I'm going to push it up to the registry. This is your specific registry. So this is my specific personal private registry. Nobody yep. except for people with my credentials or my team's credentials. Yep. Of course, you can use AAD for that authentication too. So okay. you, know, you can use grouping and the right kind of stuff. Okay. I've pushed it up to that registry. Um, but of course, this one was unsigned. Right? So it didn't ask me for anything, didn't make me, make me do any work. So potentially, this could be malicious. This could be malicious, or more importantly, like someone else, if they happen to gain access to my registry credentials, they could push up another image, right. and I wouldn't know. Yeah. Right? I have no, no knowledge. I can't tell the difference between an image that I pushed versus an image that someone else pushed, and I don't have any guarantees. OK. Um, so I'm going to activate Content Trust. It's just a, a simple environment variable switch, or you can use a command line flag. Yep. And now I'm going to start building and pushing signed images. So I'm going to go ahead and build this signed image. Uh, and I'm going to push it up. And what you're going to see this time is when I actually go to push it, it's actually going to prompt me for a signing password. Right? So now it's actually saying, I'm going to sign that image, and I'm going to push it. What's the passphrase? And this is something you would have established previous. Right. So this is something that I created when I created the registry. Right. And now that image has been successfully pushed up to the content trust registry. So now I want to take a look at what happens when we try and run an unsigned image. Um, so let's go ahead and try and run that unsigned image that I pushed earlier. What's going to happen is it's going to actually try and look for that trust data. Right. And it sees there is no signature, there is no hash in the registry, and it says, I won't, I'm not going to run it. Right. I don't trust that image. I don't know where it came from. Gotcha. But if we go ahead and run uh, that signed image that I just pushed, 
Well, now it's going to actually start and my server's running. So therefore, I know for sure that only someone who had the credentials to the registry yep. and the signing password for this image was, was the one who pushed this. And oftentimes, you'll put that in your CI CD system and have only the CI CD system have access to, say, a key vault that has that password in it. And it gives you really good, strong guarantees that every image you're running came in through your CI CD yep. system. In a trusted way. Great. Right. OK, so what about deploying my entire application that's made up of, for instance, multiple different container images? Right, so any real application is going to have a bunch of different containers coming together to form the full application. You know, what we've shown so far shows you how to deploy individual layers in your application. But you know, when you deploy the whole thing, you need something sort of like an ARM template. Mm -hmm. um, and so in Kubernetes, that's the Helm open source tool that Microsoft actually helps maintain. Um, and so what we've done now is we've taken those templates that you can build in Helm, and we've made them part of your container registry also. So all of that RBAC and all of the permissions that you were using for sharing images between different members of your team or across a company now can apply to the, uh, the, the templates that you use to deploy the entire application. Right. You don't have to put them up on a public GitHub repository or anywhere else. You know you, you've only enabled the people who really should have access to those templates to be able to deploy your application. OK, cool. So, so walk us through the process a little bit. What do you have to do with it? With the so, uh, you know, when you when you write a, a Helm chart, it's a, a text file, it's a YAML file. It's oftentimes parameterized right. so that you can say, hey, if I'm deploying into multiple regions, maybe I need to use a different database, or maybe I need to use, you know, a different uh, number of replicas because I have more load in the U.S. versus in Europe or okay. something like that. Um, once you've built that chart locally, you can package it up very similarly to the Docker build. Um, you but you package the chart. Uh, and then, just like we did, you can push it up to the chart, and then on a different machine, when you're going to do the deployment, yep. you can pull that down, uh, and it just deploys. But again, if you don't have permissions, if you don't have the right RBAC, or if you've left a team, um, you won't be able to do that sort of thing. OK, awesome stuff. Well, these updates are certainly going to help move Kubernetes to a more tangible place for line of business applications and organizations that are definitely standardized on Azure AD. Now, for those that are new to AKS, what is the best place or best way to get started? So, you know, Azure is a great place to run Kubernetes for the enterprise, but I love to have people go and try it out. Um, so we've created this site, uh, aka.ms slash learn AKS. That's going to take you to the Azure documentation to learn more about how you can deploy uh, the Azure Kubernetes service into your uh, enterprise environment and get started with containers. Great, and with the new networking enhancements, it's going to be easier for enterprises to. Oh yeah, and that stuff's players. all rolled out, ready to go. You can go start using it today. Okay, and all the role-based access control, all the integration, Absolutely. everything you've shown today, people can. Everything you saw today is available right this instant. You can go play around with. Awesome, it. great job. Well, fantastic updates, Brendan. Great to see that continued fusion between Kubernetes and Azure. And of course, you can keep watching Microsoft Mechanics for the latest updates. Follow us on Twitter, and thanks for watching. Bye for now. Thank you.